I mean, from the little amount of time that we've spent together, I mean, it's, I've already heard a thousand stories. What is your background? And because there's a lot there. I know there yeah. is. Yeah. Um, my, you know, my background is we were, we were absolutely an upper middle class family. So I was very fortunate in a lot of things. I had access to a lot of different stuff. My dad started with the hi-fi stuff in the sixties and he had this group of guys that he played golf with. Some of them were doctors. One of them was a guy named Bob Hanrahan, his family owned champion spark plugs in, in Toledo. And so these guys had some money and they started to get into the hi-fi stuff. And so it was like one upsmanship <laughs> each time it was like. Every couple months, somebody to upgrade something to be better than everybody that else in the group. Changed. No, it hasn't in some regard. And then everybody go to, you know, one house for a Friday or Saturday night, have drinks and, you know, listen to hi-fi. My dad started, he had a, a stack of Marantz tube gear, and I don't remember the model numbers, but I think it was an eight, Model 8 preamp, two nine monoblocks, and a 10B tuner. And then he got a pair of Klipsch uh, K-horns, horn horns, and he bought them unfinished because he could save 150 bucks. <laughs> And I think they were like $750 in 1964, which was, you know, you could almost buy a car for that. My mom hated the corner horns. So he got rid of the corner horns and all of a sudden a Paragon, JBL Paragon showed up and it's a freaking sideboard. I mean, the thing is a monster. Yeah. Um, she liked that a little bit better, but you couldn't put anything on top of it. Cause if they, the, the guy started rocking and rolling on it, the whole cabinet would vibrate. Sure. Um, and then he wound up trading that off for a pair of Hartsfields, JBL Hartsfields. And then we moved from Toledo and he got rid of all the gear. And then that was it for 10 years or 15 years. And then I bought him a Marantz integrated amp and a pair of uh, Kef speakers, just some bookshelf speakers because they'd got divorced and he was living in a little coach house in Philadelphia mm. and it was fine. And, but he never really got back into it. And I don't know that he ever missed it and which is really in, unusual. So I think it was a hobby and it was a kind of a, you know, uh, a short term romance and, uh, you know, it, life changes and, you know, your priorities change and all that other stuff, but it didn't change for me. I kept going hmm. in the hi-fi stuff. So when I was 17, I got a, a, a job at a Radio Shack store. So here I am, you know, immersed in this stuff. Cause in those days, Radio Shack was probably one nationally, the largest seller of stereo gear there was, Sure, you know, all the realistic stuff and the Mach one speakers and, yeah. you know, all that stuff. So you, did you opened up? hi-fi stores or i, I came in and i came in and managed five stores for a guy and wound up with a little teeny piece of equity in it but i was basically running the whole show it was called stereo studio in chicago stereo studio okay yeah, yeah. and uh good store and it, it was we did we had great lines we were probably one of the largest Harmon dealers in the country um we were definitely one of the large we were definitely the largest Harmon dealer in the city of chicago the largest kef dealer in the city of chicago what? we had Boston Acoustics. And what years were this? Would have been 80, 87 to 88 through I bailed in 92. I mean, we used to do big sales where we'd have the giant spotlights out in front. I mean, the really big military spotlights and yeah. open all night and, yeah. you know, that kind of stuff. I remember we were at the, us, uh, you know, we used to have summer CS those years in Chicago and we were in a meeting with uh, uh, Dr. Harmon and uh, it was a lot of fun. We had a good time and it was, it, you know, working key to key in retail is never that fun. But we had, a, we had, our customers were really good and, and all of our staff was really good. And, and we wound up making friends with a lot of these people. And that was really the cool thing. And especially, you know, doing the Saturday turntable clinics or the Saturday tape deck clinics. Yeah. You know, those kinds of things. It, people just be lined up out in a parking lot with their, you know, holding on to their. What, what, what kind of demonstrations or whatever were you doing? I mean, was that what it was? Like just what, showing turntable set up? No, yeah, no. Or... Yeah, setting up turntables, checking their needles. We had the microscope to look at the stylus and all yeah. the other stuff. It was all designed. You were going to wind up buying a cartridge. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Get them in the store. Get them well, in the store. I mean, and, and the truth of it is, because I actually, um, we had John Chen from Grado. Right. Um, I was talking to him and that's one thing we get customers come in and they, they want us to check their stylus. Now I've got a jeweler's loop back there. I can, I can look at it. Right. But, uh, you know, it's like John even said, he's like, you kind of got to go off the sound of it, you know, right. and, and, and how it's performing. Right. You know, it'd be really easy for me to pull up my jeweler's loop, take a look at the stylus and go, oh, it's worn. Oh, you know, oh, this is really bad. But we had the big Audio Technica, uh, microscope with the binocular eyepieces. Yeah. I mean, this thing, this rig was big Yeah. and you could put it under and you could look at it. And then it had 
um, another eyepiece coming off the front for the customer to look in. Oh, cool. <laughs> right? So you could say, oh, see, oh yeah, it's, it's worn. And yeah. look at all the grit around. I mean, you could have cleaned it or whatever, but sure. you were guaranteed to be buying a cartridge. Yeah. I mean, that was the whole point. Now, if you bought the cartridge, absolutely. We set it up, the tracking angle, VTA, sure. everything that we could sure. to make it absolutely perfect. That right. was included in the price of the cartridge. But, you know, the markup on accessories in those days, well, I mean. That's where it all is. Yeah. I mean, thank goodness for Noel Lee and Monster Cable because, oh, my God. I was going to ask you about that. You know, I, this is a super hot topic, and I know, you know, a lot of you out there, you know, you've got your opinion on it, and. You know, you look in these manuals from Marantz and Macintosh in the 70s, and they say, you know, get 18-gauge lamp cord. And I am not I am not saying you should do that. No. I, I'm, I'm past that. Right. You know, I, I'm, but I'm still at a point, at least with my room and my setup, that buying $1,000 speaker cables just doesn't make sense to me. And I... Again, if, if, if that's your thing, I'm not throwing shade at you. Yeah. I like good quality cables. Right. But it's more for reliability. Right. And maybe a little it's bit insurance. of audio jewelry. You, Ex you, exactly. You know what I mean? And I, I don't know why so many people are scared to admit that they like audio jewelry. What is wrong with that? I, I love audio jewelry. I do too. And, and I've been through that with the crazy you know, Kimber cables and all of the other stuff. And I, I'm, I absolutely, and again, I'm not trying to throw shade at anybody. I, I believe good cables are important. I, I used to, I'm not sure I do anymore. I think I can hear a difference between cables, but in my system, I have my speaker cables that I use are, were custom made. I mean, you know, they look like garden hoses. Sure. All of my interconnect cables, I just use world's best cables and I always buy Mogami. Because every studio I've ever been in my life, every piece of, of cable in that studio is Mogami. I mean, it is, they, if the engineers trust it, the recording guys trust it, and, and on the road, live venue stuff, all that cable is Mogami. I just think a good quality cable, and it doesn't need to be crazy, is cheap insurance. Even more know. so in vintage. We've got pots that are getting a little bit wonky. Right. You know, faders, you know, you got channels dropping out. Right. And uh, that's why I always say, you know, if you got a good quality cable, at least you can rule that out of the equation. Right. It's just you one know, less thing one to less worry thing. about. Exactly. You know, I totally agree with that. Did you guys have technicians? Did you yeah, we had in -house service. service? Yeah, we had our own in-house service. What did you think of the technicians? The technicians are great. I mean, they they we had a couple of guys who were really good and very well trained and uh, ex-military guys. So they were really good, but they would get a little temperamental. We've got a local tech that's been doing, you know, that's all he's ever done his entire life. Right. And um, I've heard some of his war stories, and those guys were, they were crazy. I mean, they were, they were messing with each other. They were messing with the staff. The new hires, they would put nail polish on their test leads. So and, they were making contact. Yeah. <laughs> and and you, then, couldn't, you couldn't see it. If, uh, one test station was here, and then another one was opposing, which was their situation that had pegboard in between. He would put straws together, get it to where the end of the straw would butt up to the piece of equipment the other guy was working on you take it and blow smoke drag, in it. and then it, and it would look like it was coming out of the the amplifier you know and, wow well that's funny you mentioned because i don't think most people understand that all of this stuff runs on smoke all of it right it's a magic all, smoke all it, out. yeah and it's all little components it's just move smoke around where it's supposed to be and when the smoke goes away you got to bring it back in and have them put new smoke in it that's right it's all smoke yep it is. I've seen plenty of it. <laughs> yeah, me too. And a lot of the stuff coming in wasn't necessarily big repair. Someone popped a fuse, blew a speaker, you know, got a lightning strike or whatever, you know, those kinds of things. You know, we'd get people bringing in junk. I mean, like sound design and all this stuff that they wanted repaired, GPX. and I've had plasma orbs, hair dryers, space heaters, and I've had people <laughs> get mad. That you won't repair it. That, that, yeah, that, you know, they'll say, well, it just needs soldered or just needs something fixed in there. And I'm going, we're five months backlogged on stuff we know how to work on. I'm not taking in a space heater. <laughs> you know, it's going to take two hours of our text time just disassembling it to right. get to And you're not going to want to pay for that. You could buy a new space heater for that. Well, totally. Real quick, I hope you guys are enjoying this conversation with Ed. We had a blast making this video, but... 
we just got this new version of one of your favorite shirts in. So definitely head over to skylabsaudio.com. We really do appreciate it. It helps the channel immensely. Thank you for watching this video. We'll get back to it. What's Ed saying now? But for the most part, I mean, Harmon was actually really pretty reliable. But remember the Watt Wars, Harmon never participated. No. Right. They the 330C was one of the most popular selling receivers in the world. It was 30 watts a channel. And if you put up against a, a 100 watt Kenwood, it would smoke it all day long. Well, I don't think Yamaha did either. No, they didn't really. They get. They did get they, into the 120. 20. Yeah, CR it was like 120 20. watts or something. Yeah, maybe. but Not nowhere more. near. You no, know, the Toshiba and the techniques at 330 the techniques, watts yeah. and all that nonsense. Harmon never played that game, so they did different stuff. So they made twin powers. Yeah, you know, two mono, two mono amps and a receiver. Well, I mean, I no think, one ever thought of that. I think that's why they get a, at least in my opinion, you know, they're they're just one little notch above. You know, they they weren't going for the eye candy and everything else. They were focused on sound quality, build quality, and just making an elegant great sounding product that's the way i've always looked at yeah at harman kardon and and yamaha in a way too absolutely you, you no know, question yeah the, the, they stay no, true to their their beginnings totally I, they're, yeah. they're probably they're the only one left i think that's probably true to its yeah. origins well Yamaha's a really interesting company too they could almost go even a step further where they make musical instruments right. pianos right. motorcycles drums. right and, they make every kind of musical instrument right Exactly. So, I mean, brass so you, and everything. You, you could take a recording from start to finish. Do you listen to records a lot? Oh, I didn't know. You, I haven't seen a turntable in. Your... I've done it. I haven't done a turntable. I have a Fluence RT eighty four, um, and it's just it. It. I had at one point. I had a Versa Dynamics turntable, which in the late eighties, Jay Gordon Holt called the best turntable in the world. I could have bought a Corvette for the cost of that damn thing. Um, and it had air pumps and it was a vacuum platter and a, and a air bearing tone arm. And I just, it was, mm. so I stopped and then I got out of records for a long time. I just had a techniques, uh, direct drive turntable for the longest time. And that was fine, but I wasn't listening to money records and I started back again. So I have a, a fluence turntable, which I really like. I think it's well built and well made, but I, I did splurge a bit on the cartridge. So I run an AT VM 540 ML. Have you heard any of the premium presses that have come out? Like I've the, got a bunch of them. You, you do. Yeah, what, do you, what do you think of the, like the UHQRs? And they're, the, they're, they sound wonderful. Yeah. I mean, all right, anything Chad touches yeah. is going to be good because yeah. he's a purist and he's a, he's an old school guy. And, um, you know, it, he did that remix of, uh, of Asia. And I can't think of the engineer's name who did it. But, um, was it Kevin Gray? Kevin Gray? No. Kevin, no, it was... Bernie? Bernie, 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 Bernie Grunman. Grunman. Yeah, because yeah. he did the original. He did the original. He did this remix. Yeah. And Bernie had his notes from the original mix. Remaster or rem remaster? Just remastered. I don't think they, no, I don't they, think they remix, remix it. it. Uh -uh. Uh, and they didn't compress it. They didn't run any crap to it. I think he just probably cleaned up some stuff and you know, maybe some glitches. And, you know, it depends on the quality of the tape that they were using, too. So th those are a good job. You know, the whole big thing with mobile fidelity using DSD to cut. People have been using CD to cut LPs for a long time. So, and you can tell, but I don't care about the DSD thing. Music transcends the playback medium. When I was a kid in my 64, 65 Mustang, listening to music on the AM radio, guess what? I'm still tapping my foot. Yeah. I'm still enjoying it. I'm yeah. still having fun with it. I still love the music. So like John Darko says, I'm a music first audiophile. The music is sure. far more important to me than the, the actual playback medium, which is why I was able to put together a, a relatively modestly priced system that I think sounds amazing and compared to some of the more expensive stuff and some of the crazy expensive stuff I've been exposed to in my life, I can sit down in my basement and listen for three, four hours without any fatigue and absolutely no problem whatsoever. Um, because it's the music I want to hear, not the box, not the cable, not the, well, have you gone through struggles with that though, too? Because I've wanted to talk about that, which is the curse of the audio file in that you constantly are fighting whether or not you're listening to the music or whether or not you're listening to your system. My thing was, is, you know, when I think about the time of my life where I listened to the most music and enjoyed listening to music the most, I was listening to Sirwin Vegas, which I couldn't listen to for more than an hour today. They weren't set up properly. I had one speaker in a corner and one in the middle of the room. Right. And I didn't understand the sweet spot. I didn't understand any of it. 
and that was the most fun I ever had listening to music. I never thought about quality. Absolutely. And that's the thing. It was the music that drove the pleasure, not the gear. The that's gear right. was just an ends to a mean yep. or a means to an end, excuse me, to get the music to your ears, whatever it was. Right. And same thing, you know, back in high school with, you know, having a hi-fi didn't matter what it was. It didn't matter if it was, you know, a, a pair of Zenith Allegro speakers and a, you know, an RCA little all-in-one eight-track amplifier. Nope. I mean, it didn't matter. No. The um, wedge. But, yeah. Yeah. Right. It just, you wanted to hear the music. The music. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, and then of course you got to the point where it became all the same music. So, you know, I remember in high school, you, oh, we're all going over to Paul's house. We go over to Paul's house. Everybody's down in the basement in a haze of weed smoke, listening sure. to the dark side of the moon for the 12th time that day. And then I remember putting six by nines on the back deck of the speaker of the car. Cause you know, the Mustang didn't have a big enough parcel shelf to put him in underneath. Yeah. Only one speaker cut out anyway. Yeah. And every time he stopped, they'd fly. <laughs> oh yeah. I had home speakers in my car for a while. Yeah. And, but I, I jam on that stereo all the time. Yeah. Just cause I love the music and you, you can, it's easy to get away from it. And it is that, the curse of the autofile. It really? Yeah. You know, is that, oh, I need, do I need to tow that speaker in another yeah. degree? Do I? Is that speaker cable, is it touching the floor? Sorry. Um, you know, yeah. that kind of nonsense. It, you know, maybe I need, so when, when I was in it in the, in the 80s and the, in the early 90s, we had the green pen for around the CD to, oh, you sure. know, yeah. supposedly absorb yep. stray laser yep. light and then rubber sorbethane rings that would yep. go on the I CD. And then there was a thing called the VPI brick, which was like a, a ceramic thing impregnated with metal filings or whatever that's supposed to suck the magnetic field out of whatever. Yeah. Oh my God, just turn on the music and listen to the music, you know, stop this nonsense. I think that having a great system and if you can afford to do it, go for it, totally go for it, but yeah. don't fall for the, don't forget it's the music you, that got you interested well, and the, it's not the gear. The problem with it too, though, is that, you know, a lot of my favorite recordings are not well made because no. I like the music that hasn't been produced to death the the labels and the producers have destroyed more bands blind melon just the first one off the top of my head if, if you hear no rain the original intention of it off nico and then you listen to it after capital got a hold of it it's horrible in yeah. comparison sometimes i don't listen to the music that i really like because i'm sitting in in, in front of a stereo system that's almost too revealing mm -hmm. And it, it dictates. Then you're listening what, to the equipment. Then I'm listening to the equipment. The problem with a revealing system or being an audiophile is you wind up listening to freaking audiophile recordings. You exactly. Know, Gregorian monks, monks chanting in a, in a church in Transylvania. And it's like no music anybody wants to hear. Ooh, the, the Middle Eastern guitar mandolin kind of thing. It sounds wonderful. And I have some sure, recordings like sure, that. Sure, sure, sure. But I'm sorry. Play something people like to hear. Yeah. You know, and that was the... I don't know. There were a couple of rooms that was were doing that, and those were the rooms that were crowded all the time. Yeah. What 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 do you think of the Expona experience? I think it's I think it's wonderful for the consumer just to just to see some of the brands that they may never have heard of, some of the non mainstream stuff. But unfortunately, what winds up happening is you get exposed or see videos on the same product from a lot of different people because the manufacturer sends it out to everybody. And then puts an embargo on it. So the day the embargo lifts, there's 30 videos about this particular piece. And I get it. That's fine. And if, you know, if you've got something to add in, or if that's a product that a consumer is looking at, the more information they have, the better, I think. Yeah. Well, um, everybody's got a different person that they trust. Right. And that's the thing is, you know, again, trust. The, the, when I make a YouTube video, what I'm telling you is what I feel, not what you should feel. And if you kind of, if what I'm saying kind of clicks with you, then all right, then maybe I've got some, I can add some value to your decision process, whatever that is. You know what I really like about your channel and what I really like about what you do is I feel like a lot of the reviewers out there, they're kind of regurgitating the same talking points. And to me, it doesn't seem genuine. The highs are this, the mids are forward. I don't know why when you talk about what you hear, I believe it. I, I honestly feel like you are able to hear what you're saying and you're you're truthful about it and I, you know there are a lot of great reviewers oh out no there. question there's a lot of good guys I, yeah, and I, I follow I, a ton of them and and i have a relationship with several of them that i value the relationship a ton i'm not trying to be different for the sake of being different i'm just no. trying 
I'm trying to be me. Well, that you got to be you because right? you can't maintain being something you're not. A great line from the the movie Sting with Robert Redford and Paul Newman was, "Once you make, once you do the con, you got to keep the you con. You got to keep the con. Yeah. Once you tell that lie, you have to maintain That's that right. lie forever. And I don't have time to I don't, think I about can't, what I, I, I can't care I couldn't less. remember. The truth it. is easier to remember. It's way go. easier to remember. My absolute, you know, rule of thumb is: Can I sit and listen to it for a couple hours without wanting to turn it down or running from the room or whatever? To me, that's, that's, all right, that's the sweet spot for me. I have, because I, that's how I listen. Is it completely revealing? No, it doesn't matter to me necessarily if it, if I'm getting enjoyment from the music. So if I'm tapping my foot, I know I got, that's a decent product. And if I'm tapping my foot for two hours, I know it's a really good product. The other one too is I have this thing that there are certain recordings on certain systems that all of a sudden, I, my entire body will be covered with goosebumps. That it, that physical response to that music, it's emotional. You almost kind of, yeah. wow, you know, that kind oh, of a yeah. thing. That's what I'm, I, I, that's what I want everybody to experience. Yeah. Yeah, and you can do it with all kinds of different equipment. It doesn't need to be stupid expensive stuff. And I, I believe me, I've seen systems in homes that were literally hundreds of thousands of dollars sure. that never get played. Oh, yeah, of course. I mean, it's, yeah, it's yeah. part of the decor. Yeah. It's not. It could be in a vacation house. I've seen it. Yeah. I've installed them. Yeah. And that's the thing is they, it's jewelry at that point. It's a decorating thing at that point. Maybe occasionally I'll turn it on and, hey, listen to how loud it goes. You know, yeah. that's the. And that's the other thing a lot of everyday people who aren't into the audio so much is, oh, I bet they come down and they see my system. I bet that gets loud. Well, no, I don't want it loud. <laughs> I, actually, you get it all the time. I mean, look at those big Sermon Vegas. And I'll, there. I'll put speakers out there and I'll say to John or Eric, I'll say, the person that walks in here and buys these, the first thing out of their mouth will be, How I loud? bet these get loud. Yeah. And and I, I've been there. I was that kid. Me too. And when I was a kid. You were yeah. going into Best Buy, you know, and the sales guy's standing there and I'm like, which is the loudest set of speakers you got here? We were so consumed with the enjoyment of the music that we wanted to get all of it. Absolutely. As, and, I and wanted if to that feel was it in every... Right, I wanted to pound in yes. my chest. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. it was the physical thing, because sure. that's how we saw it when we went live and saw, you know, go to the Iowa Absolutely. State Fair and see yeah. Cheap Trick, you sure. know, or whatever. Yep. It's a physical experience. Yep. And I want people to have that emotional, physical experience like I get. And so I want to try to identify products that I think can give you that. I can't tell you everything that needs to go in the system because there is a synergy. I totally believe in system synergy. Absolutely. And I, you know, uh, uh, I have a, not a super expensive pair of ELAC speakers, but there's still, it's a $1,500 pair of speakers. Maybe, yeah. you know, I maybe have a total of $5,000 in my system. Sure. I'll put it up against anybody's stuff. Yeah. Um, but only if I'm the one making the judgment, because it's based on what I want. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so helping someone uh, find out what they want, I got to describe as much as I can about the sound, sure. but I also want to describe the emotion and like, you know, this re the review, you know, like the, the Marantz classic Marantz integrated amp. I did the review on that's an emotional piece. I've had that thing forever. Um, and actually it was the, it's a, it's a, a manufacturer sample. It's an engineering sample. It's not even a regular line consumer product. It was the, you know, that was the, the manufacturing sample that went to Marantz in the U S that Ken Ishiwata signed off on. And so, I love yeah. that thing. It's my, you know, and the emotional, uh, the, the emotional reward I get from listening to it. Is it the most accurate thing in the world? I don't know. Probably not. Oh, but I love listening to it. And I, I feel connected to the music and I feel connected to all kinds of other stuff. And that's the thing about music is it can bring up memories. I hear the Queen song, you're my best friend. It'll, it will no, bring me to tears. It's a photo album. It's a, yeah. It's it a bring me to be. tears. Cause that was my wife and I, our song. Sure. When we started dating in 1976. Yeah. So those, there's so much of that that brings back those memories. And I love that part of it. I love, me too. you know, and LPs, well, I love the nostalgia of physical media. Sure. They can sound great. Yep. But I find myself now, I'm streaming more than ever. I, I'm probably 90% streaming, 10% vinyl. And it just depends. It depends on the time of year. In the it, mood. In the mood. You know, do All I feel like dragging something out and cleaning it? And, yeah. And then putting it on. And sometimes I do. You yeah, know, I'm me like, too. I want to sit down with my my 12 inch piece of art, and um, you know, I want to focus on it. Where I'm 
you know, I'm more likely to get up or get distracted or want to listen to something different when I have the control in my hand. One piece of advice I could give to everybody who's watching, if you're streaming, the, the, the absolute tendency is, all right, next track, next track, next track, next track. Yeah. Don't. Start an album, listen to the whole damn thing all the way through, because that's, that's how we all listen to music. When we started out, we listened to a, to a side. You get up and flip it, sure, and you listen to the other side. We didn't have the the luxury. You wanted to skip a track, you had to go over and physically move the tone arm to but do it. Some some albums were built so well, like Abbey Road. You flip yeah. you flip it over, and the first song you get on the second side is "Here Comes the Sun." You're like, right. That's kind of perfect, right? Um, yeah. yeah. Whoever crafted the track listings on some of those in those days, well, the, were, were, were magic was dictated though by limitations and vinyl too right you know right and, and, and albums today you know depending on the artist a lot of times they're not worth listening to the whole thing because they're just using filler it for, yeah it's just filler right you know and, it, and it's become you know spotify and, and spotify primarily has become a singles sort of uh, uh marketing tool for the artist is the singles you know one of the few that i don't think does that at all is taylor swift her out. I mean, I don't not. A, I I don't listen to her music. I I respect what she's done. I mean, fifty percent of all the LP sold in the United States are Taylor Swift. Or I mean, I'm sorry, one in fifteen albums sold in the United States is Taylor Swift, and fifty percent of the people buying don't have record players. She's hitting a home run Some, with that. Something one. with Taylor Swift though is she usually does four variants of each record, and she's then a, people the queen buy. of marketing. Well, I, well right? Absolutely. Isn't that what it's all about? Yeah. Her, and if you enjoy her music, that's wonderful. And she'll she'll do the vinyl. Yeah, and she'll yeah. spend the money to get it done right. At, at least they're doing that. You know? Yep. And the other thing I love is you go out and, you know, you go to some indie band, you know, bar band kind of thing, and they're selling cassettes. Yeah. Because it's the easiest thing for them to duplicate their music and on. And it's a lot cheaper. Yeah. And so that's, I think, driving part of the cassette revival. It could be. I've, I've got several local um, cassettes from local bands because they were doing the same thing. But, you know, getting 500 LPs made oh. is 10 times the cost of getting 500 cassette tapes made. Right. And, and the it, time taken is just like, it's yeah. like a year out. And I really want to thank Ed for making the trip over from Chicago. I hope you all enjoyed this conversation. It was a lot of fun. We actually got about four hours worth of footage. I think we might be putting out smaller little clips in the members section. But if you liked the video, definitely hit the like button. Leave a comment of just a smiley face. Let us know that you'd like to see more of this type of content. We had a lot of fun making it. And maybe we can get people even from a little bit further away. Definitely go check out Ed at Old Guy Hi-Fi. Subscribe to his channel. And um, we'll see you in the next video. Thank you very much. Thanks.